Hello and welcome to an introduction to biological recording. My name is Ben Town. I'm the Community and Volunteers Officer at Giggle, which is London Environmental Record Centre. I'm going to give you um, a brief introduction to the history of biological recording, um, the basics of a record, how you can then use those records, what they're used for, and hopefully get you set up uh, and recording yourself. So biological recording really started um, in 1789 um, of a man called Gilbert White who published The Natural History of the Antiquities of Selborne. Uh, this was a, um, a piece of work written by Gilbert White himself um, detailing his observations around him and his, um, in his local environment. Uh, it was the first time uh, that we've had any recorded um, recording of, of, of the environment and, and species in particular. This was um, then formalised somewhat by H.C. Watson, who developed the, the vice counties, which you can see in the map there. Um, there are 112 vice counties in the UK, um, splitting up uh, the UK into more manageable sections. Um, they're usually county based. Um, obviously, London itself is a amalgamation of multiple counties, so we have a number of, of vice counties that cover the, the Greater London boundary. In 1858, uh, the Haggerston Entomological Society, which later formed into the London Natural History Society in 1913, um, started regular recording in London, and the LNHS are still very active in London and um, are one of the, the biggest contributors towards biological recording in the capital. Uh, ALERC, which is the Association of Local Environmental Record Centres, formed in 2005. Um, Giggle is part of that association, and um, it's a, a network of, of with record centres across the whole UK, um, championing and, and helping to use biological recording for, for decision making and for planning, um, of which Google are a part of that. So there's a, a few things that you need when you have a biological record. They are, are the, the four W's, so what, where, when and who. Um, these can be as specific or broad as is possible. Um, in terms of species, it can be common names, it can be scientific names, it can be up to groups, it can be um, generic descriptions of species. Again, with locations, can be from uh, precise grid references to, to street names, to parks, to areas. Um, the whale is usually a date or a year or a month if um, the, the date itself isn't, isn't available. And the who uh, is usually a, a recorder's name, um, but can be a group name or um, in the case of online recording can be um, a, a username. Uh, these are, are held by a us at Giggle, um, but not used and are mainly held in case we need to query the, the, uh, the record later on. So using that uh, bit, of, bit of knowledge, we can, we can build a record. Uh, we did a project with a, a group called Dragons of London who um, record the uh, appearance of, of dragon symbology, of dragon statues and, and other icon, icon, iconography around London. Um, so it's a, a great example they've set to, to use for recording. So when we're looking at what? We're looking at the Dread Goth, which is that, that red dragon there. Um, where? Well, it's quite clearly in the London Welsh Centre. When uh, this image was taken on the the eighth of the first, twenty twenty one, and who uh, me? So that's that builds a very basics of a record, and that's that's minimum you need um, to submit a record. But there are extras, um, extra details which would be encouraged. So grid references, uh, whether that's a, a TQ grid reference or uh, a latitude and longitude. With a, with a determiner present, so that's a secondary observer who is usually an expert and can confirm any ID. Um, abundances, so it can be simple as something like a number of specimens, or um, we also have abundance qualifiers such as, um, as sex, so male, female, unknown, um, of ju well, it's life stage, a juvenile, whether it's an adult, whether it's um, recently fed, whether it's a hatchling, that sort of stuff. So is there anything that can help us identify what life stage or what, how many of individuals of that in that record there are. Uh, these can also go in additional comments. So that could be um, if it was perch, for example, or, or 
if it was a roosting record or a nesting record. Uh, the record type is usually field record, but it can be stuff like dead or auditory records in particular, in particular for bats. And then any information on the habitat as well. So what habitat is that that, that specimen that you're observing? What, what habitat is it existing in? So once you get all these details, you can you can store them, you can plot them. So this is what we did with Dragons of London. We plotted their, their data on a lovely map. And just to kind of give it a, an idea of, of what the very basic um, visual visualizations of, of, of data can be. So in, in, in this group's case, it was very much a, uh, a visual, but there are many, many, many reasons why you should, we should record. Um, I've purposely left this blank um, because everyone's reasons are different and you can infer your own reasons on why you want to record. But some of the, the reasons that we um, come across most is to, to aid conservation efforts, to support and ch or challenge planning applications. Um, to find out what there is to preserve on a site. So if you're, you're starting from the very baseline, you need to make a make a, an idea of, of what, what's available to preserve or what's available to, to bring in. Um, some people do it as a hobby. They enrich their personal collection of records. Um, some people just out of interest, um, both to see what's in their lo locality as well as um, interest further, further widespreading, such as a, another version of a hobby. Um, or to contribute to national schemes or local schemes. So um, they, these schemes similar to, to what Giggle do um, with our, our influence of planning, they, the, the schemes can contribute to, to much wider conservation pitches or, or decision making um, across the whole of the UK. But it's very important to, to take note that there are some biases that can appear in, inherently in our, in our recording. Um, the biggest one of which is taxa. So people tend to record stuff that either they like, either is easier to find or is abundant. So butterflies and birds tend to be the really big winners in, the, in this category. Plants as well. Um, most of our records are, are birds or butterflies or plants. Uh, they're a very popular group um, and have quite a, in the case of birds especially, have quite a, a low um, barrier to entry so, so people can kind of get out and start recording birds as, as soon as possible. Um, whether it's expertise, so expertise on certain species can be in certain areas which does limit the hot coverage as a whole. Um, an example we've got is arachnids. Most of our arachnid records come from a group called Eff Essex Field Club who are based out in East London and Essex. Um, this does mean that the rest of London is very fairly uh, limited in terms of the expertise available to identify these with difficult to ID species. Other groups such as arachnids are, are particularly difficult to, to get right and get um, correct IDs on so, so the, the expertise really don't exist to have a, a much wider representation in the data set. Similarly to taxa we have rarity so people tend to record stuff that's interesting and rare and they tend not to, to look at the more common species so in our data set we have um, over 32,000 sparrowhawk records, but only 900 odd um, brown rat records, which I don't think is particularly representative of London. So it's, it's about trying to get out there and recording these everyday common species and building a bigger picture of, of what's actually out there. Um, of course, if you're uh, doing it on a more casual basis, then the, the rare species is going to be stuff that's interesting. So it's the difference between going out and recording versus a, a more thorough survey, I suppose. And the last one is about location. So people tend to either record in areas that are near them or that are known for good recording. So Richmond Park, which is highlighted um, the borough of Richmond in the south uh, west in, in darkest green, as are most blackbird records. That's not to say that there's more blackbirds in that borough than there are in the rest of London, but due to the, the, the amount of footfall and um, the amount of recording that happens in that area, we have a lot higher records. So again, similar to the rarity and, and the tax that you ought to get a bit more um, out there to look at it as a survey method rather than an individual recording effort. So it's really important to, 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 to take note that when you are recording a site that you don't just pick the sites that are the richest and the best, that you do try and do a, a more blanket approach to the area you're interested in. So once these records are collected, once they've been uh, put into our data system and, and uh, validated then they do go out to our partners and our, our, our community working groups 
So these can include local authorities such as the London boroughs, um, students and researchers who have recently done our working with the uh, Zoological Society of London, so hoping to influence and in, in, inform research. Uh, simply members of the public and friends of groups, these are usually either out of interest for local sites or um, in engaging with planning decisions. Uh, other record centres, so us and our, our group of the local London and South East record centres, uh, which includes London and the surrounding counties, um, share data and, and use data um, on, our, on our projects to develop data sets as well as to pass on to, our, again, our partners. And recording groups such as the LNHS, who I've, I mentioned briefly, um, it's it's great interest for them to build atlases and, and build a picture of, of recording in London and of what species are avail um, available and around. And then NGOs, so a big part of us is the London Wildlife Trust, the non-government organisations that use this to to inform uh, conservation work and um, hopefully to to make better decisions in in, in Greater London. So an example of a project we've worked with and how important recording for our projects, this is working with one of the NGOs I mentioned, the Citizen Sue, who were tasked with introducing water voles or reintroducing water voles back into the hogs mill in Kingston, uh, which is that pointy bit down the bottom. Um, it was a, a, rec a recording led project. So the first stage of that was to work out what we actually have already on, on record, um, the water vole records for the, for the hogs mill that existed, and there's, there's not that many. Um, so we all showed a need for, for reintroduction as well as what American mink records are the main predator of the water voles in, in these areas. Um, it was important to work up where they were so you don't reintroduce water voles in, in areas of high density American mink um, doesn't really provide the best opportunity for that species to, to re-establish itself. So once we'd worked out what the areas and the priority areas to look at we um, devised a, a grid system, a traffic light grid system, uh, separating the river into 100 meter squares. And then went to every one of these squares and assessed the habitat quality for introduction. So um, it was it was using uh, habitat standard um, survey method and a scoring system to work out where it's best to to um, put your effort into into introducing the species. So what did this allow us to do? So it allowed identification of possible reintroduction sites through our survey and through um, the, the, the desk um, study. Um, it provided an impetus for further surveying, so it implied where, where we need to really focus our effort in, in working out where the real best habitat in those squares is and, and where it matched up with the, with the potential for species um, records. And um, as part of a an outreach of this project, it, it uh, highlighted the importance of recording to the wider community. So it was a big volunteer engaged project um, to help to reintroduce these animals. So this data can be used for you know, a, a conservation reintroduction program, but it's also the same data can be used for planning, for supporting and challenging developments. Um, it can be used to establish monitoring and um, long-term recording can be used as a, a way of monitoring species populations. As I said, um, it's currently used in research, and then we have some some more creative uses which are both in-house and have, have have come from from researchers and come from from outside. You can also use the data for more model data sets. So this is a project we did with Red Frog up in Camden, uh, generating a, a habitat network map. Uh, they wanted to use it in their neighbourhood plan to inform where they need to put the um, conservation effort to improve that habitat connectivity. Um, you can use it for creating Hotspot maps, this is with the Barbican Wildlife Garden down in the City of London and was the aim for, the, for this project was to, to highlight the importance of the map for the local area in terms of species richness as well as recording effort. Um, and this has gone on to, to lead into an application to become a local nature reserve. Or whether it's something a bit more London wide, so our, our biodiversity hotspots and planning highlights areas where you're more likely to need uh, environmental data searches for, for planning applications. Um, and, and uses a, a combination of, of designated species as well and, and habitat um, to highlight areas of importance for conservation um, to planners and potential planners as well. So data could come to us in a number of ways. We have our recording forms, which you can see here. 
Um, so it's a very simple put in your, your, your four W's for the additional data uh, and send to us in an Excel spreadsheet. Data can be collected through remote sensing. So a established project in the Olympic Park has been remote sensing bat data through all um, bat monitors. You can use recording apps such as iNaturalist or iRecord. Um, these feed directly into the Google database and also provide um, the community an, op uh, an option to, to validate and verify records. There's difference in taxa collection. So plants have uh, a DAFOR scale. So it's a, a way of, of working out the abundance of an area, um, that species in an area. Birds, for example, have um, breeding records put down as a zero abundance. Um, so it's important to, to, to work out what you're recording and, and, the, and the correct ways that you're recording it. And then how to submit it. So you can submit it directly to me at Giggle um, through our form or uh, via one of those apps. So um, as long as the data gets to us, it will, it will be uh, useful for, for our partners and, and for helping London become a, a, a more environmentally conscious place. So we, we, we work with a lot of date, um, different um, local and, and national groups. So whether it's down to, as previously mentioned, Red Frog up in Camden or the Friends of Wandsworth Common, um, up to larger nationwide institutions like Butterfly Conservation and the MBN Atlas and everything in between. All these groups have a, a massive impact on, on recording in, in the UK um, and, and really uh, have different goals and needs for recording. So it's important that these base records um, are useful for, for all these groups and then that they can, um, despite whatever level they're connected on, can be, can be used for a variety of different projects and scales. So we, we'd, we'd ideally make, hope that that, that data um, sharing between these groups that I've just mentioned and, and the recorder, so yourself and us, the data manager, we'd hope it would look like this. Um, unfortunately, it looks a bit more like this. It's a, a bit more complicated. There's a lot of double checking and, and validating and back and forth and, and feedback and, and feed into um, different areas. Um, luckily, that's what we're here for. So once the data comes to us, it goes through all these processes before going out to, to stakeholders who can really make use of the data. So it's, it's nice to look at it like this. So we have our stakeholders split into our partners and our clients. And then all of those groups I've, I've mentioned fit it nice and neatly into, into these two groups. So um, this is more of a uh, where the data goes after coming to us. Um, but all those processes beforehand happen um, behind the scenes. So uh, the recorders who send stuff to us and the stakeholders who benefit from it, um, both professional and community, um, don't need to worry about any of the, the complex processes. Um, that makes that data such high quality um, for using using for their projects. So there are some obstacles to sharing. Um, you have the uh, issues in trust. So whether that's trust, trust in the data or um, trust in, in where the data is going and that it's being used for the right thing. Uh, whether that's a data capacity. So whether, for example, Giggle may have a, a limit to the number of records to currently hold just over 7 million. Um, so we're not going to any of that yet. But uh, the capacity for us to hold those records and the capacity for the recorders to keep and maintain them. Um, licenses, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, whether the data is either open data, so it's available to maintain and use under the licenses that have been attached, um, or whether it's a fair data, so it's findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Um, we tend to run under a fair data model. Uh, we are funded by our, our stakeholders and our partners and that uh, funding goes into the maintenance and the um, quality assurance of the data that we have. Open data tends to lack that, so it's either a lower quality or a lower resolution because there's, no, there's uh, very few avenues for funding to um, be able to, to put that work into the data. So funding is a, is a big obstacle to sharing. Sometimes the funding is just not there, um, which is why we, we have our, our partners to, to enable us to, to, to do that extra middleman work. So the licenses, as I mentioned, we, we operate under three main licenses, the government open license, which is all of our data on the London data store, um, which is I, I would advise having a look at. It's a, a brilliant um, library of, of data concerning um, all aspects of, of London's environment. And it's a Creative Commons, which you can see on, on the diagram, 
So that's a, a CCBY, which is the created commons by attribute. Um, if it's a, an NC, so a non-commercial data, whether it's an SA, so adaptations must be shared under the same license, or whether it's an ND, so you can't make any derivatives of it. Um, you can put any combination of these, these letterings to, to, to tailor the license to what you want your data to be used for, um, or whether it's our, our own Google Data Use Licenses. So that's what we work with under our, um, our agreements with our partners, with community groups, with members of the public. Um, they have certain limitations on sharing data um, depending on, on your level of access, but um, we try to be as open as possible. We try to give as much access as, as is reasonable and while also protecting the, the confidence of our of our recorders. So where does Google fit into all this? So we are, we're London's LERC, we're the local environmental record center. And we have been since the late nineties. Um, we are data creators and managers. We don't own the data. The owners of the data are the people who have sent it to us. And we make that very important. It's, it's an important distinction that we don't own the data ourselves. We are simply custodians. Uh, we engage in partnership and community work. So as a community interest company, all the um, profit we make from our partnership side is put back into our community work uh, with members of the public with recording groups. We help to promote, facilitate and uh, recording as well as provide training on, on recording and process a variety of record types, whether that be uh, physical data sets such as books or, 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 or notepads up to um, more complex data extracts and coding and, and, and all sorts, everything in between. So there's, there's not a, um, a data set that we, we, we've received that we haven't managed to incorporate yet. And hopefully all this will aim to, to help to improve London's knowledge of the environment and help to inform decision making as well. And I hope that um, every decision made in, Lo in London has a, has a, a correct amount of, of um, data backing it up. So that's kind of a brief intro for, for how to get into recording and what, what recording is. There's a few reference links for stuff I had mentioned previously, some of the groups, some of the organizations, some of the licenses and how to, to kind of get access to those. And then there's some further interest links as well. So um, some, some interest on, on getting record, started recording, finding your local record center um, are on the recorders day, which happens every year. Um, as well as some of the um, larger groups such as the Biological Record Center. So yeah, thank you for listening. Um, hopefully all sides will be made available.